Way to go, Todd. I understand Todd's in the service. Todd, where are you? Stand up. Come on. Oh, there, there he is, Todd. Good, good, to, good for you. Todd, I have one question. Did you shower this morning? You know, we just want to... What a great thing. Good for you. Good for you. What hits me about Todd is he's so young. I, uh, this year, Holly and I turned 66, and it sucks. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, but I decided to embrace my aging, unlike Pastor Dennis, who's still in denial. I, uh, you know, and it, it's a strange thing, because you remember when you kind of woke up in your 20s, and then you uh, turned 30, kind of like milk turning sour, you know, and then you, you're pushing the 40. Then they would say, you know, you're going to make it to 50. Then after 60, they stopped talking about it. You know, you're kind of, what's going on? I, I mean, I, I used to be a honk. Now I'm, I'm more of a chunk. But you look through these eyes, and, you know, it looks like I was 30 years old again. Until you look in the mirror, and you just go, oh, man, I'm better looking than that. And then you realize you're not, you know. <laughs> things that used to work don't work anymore. The things that still work, nobody cares about the fact that they work, and but I'll tell you this, you know, as you, I've always said all wisdom is is accumulation of boy, I'm not going to do that again. And you do begin to accumulate some wisdom. But with that wisdom, you begin to ask yourself some questions about your life. You know, has my life been meaningful? Is there any significance to it? Am I, am I going to be remembered when I'm, when, when I'm gone? You, you begin to really think about, uh, and you begin even sometimes worrying about the meaning of life, having some kind of sense of, of purpose and significance. Um, do you remember the name Howard Hughes? Well, let me ask you this. Do you remember Leonardo DiCaprio? <laughs> all right, he played Howard Hughes in the movie Aviator, all right? But Howard Hughes, he, uh, he left an estate when he died back in 1976 worth $2.3 billion. Now, back then, that made him one of the richest men in the world. After he died, Time Magazine wrote this to commemorate his life. Here's what the end of his life was like. Quote, Hughes emerges from the hidden years as a tortured, troubled man who wallowed in self-neglect, lapsed into periods of near lunacy, lived without comfort of joy in prison-like conditions, and, and he ultimately died for a lack of a medical device that his own foundation had developed. But then the article ends with a commemoration in Las Vegas for this man's life, the richest man who's ever uh, at that time. It says, for a brief moment, the casinos fell silent. Housewives stood uncomfortably clutching their paper cups full of coins at the slot machines. The blackjack game paused, and at the crap table, strict stick men cradled the dice and the crooks and their wands. Then a pit boss looked at his watch, leaned forward and whispered, okay, roll the dice. He had his minute. What is wrong with this picture? This whole guy's life is commemorated with one phrase. He's had his minute. I mean, is, is, is that the worth of life? Is that a meaningful life? Significant. My, my wife has a very close friend who has cancer. When the cancer was discovered, Holly decided that she was going to make her good friend at least once a week laugh out loud by sending her a card. Her friend lives uh, in, in, in near Mount Hermon, uh, in Mount Hermon. Holly, we, we live in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, and, and so every week, Holly finds a card, and she mails it to her friend every week just to make her laugh out loud to ease some of the burden of the pain of the cancer. She's been doing this now for 14 years. 14 years. And she's found some great cards. And one of the last few cards she found was, was this one. It was about a fairy tale of a princess. Once upon a time, there was a princess who was like a size four or something. She could eat and drink whatever she wanted and always stayed really skinny and had flat, firm abs, even though she never went to the gym. Every time she tried on jeans, the very first pair fit perfectly. <laughs> she lived in a great, big, beautiful castle with her handsome, multimillionaire husband, who was busy all the time buying her giant diamonds, taking her to Hawaii, giving her foot massages, and telling her how beautiful she was. And then one day she was eaten by a dragon, and no one cared. The end. (laughs) 
it does make you start thinking about quality of life. And what kind of meaningful life am I living? Will anybody remember me when I'm gone? Or, or will they say, well, he had his minute. Or will they simply forgot, even though I was eaten by a dragon? Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Now, I, I was told that uh, uh, you use uh, the NIV here. I, I don't have an NIV. So I went out yesterday and bought a new Bible and an NIV for this morning. So if I will go buy a new Bible, you can at least pick and bring your own by, right? So that's enough guilt and shame. I was raised Southern Baptist. You know, I had the hell scratch on me every week. That's all the shame and guilt I'll use, but bring your Bibles with you. But anyhow, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's a summary of everything Jesus taught. So if you want to get back to what did Jesus actually say? What did Jesus actually teach from his lips? Uh, you'll find it all right there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Well, when he comes to chapter 6, towards the end of the chapter, he says, I want to talk to you about this worry thing. You tend to find all kinds of reasons to, to worry. Our, our English word worry is, comes from an old German term that speaks of strangulation. Worry is actually an emotional, at times a, a mental strangulation. Dr. Charles Mayo, founder of the Mayo Clinics, he, he wrote this, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, and the whole nervous system. He says, I, I never have known a man to die of overwork, but I have known a lot of men who died of, of worry. So he gets some brilliant guy comes along and he says, well, hey, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to do that? Don't worry, be happy. It's been said that 40% of our worries never happen. Whew, that's good to know. 30% of our concerns have to do with the past, and you can't change the past. Well, you worry about it, think a lot about the past, but there is something for you to learn about your past. You will never have a better past because your past has passed. Can't do anything about it. It's done. Then it says, then another 22% of our worries, needless worries, about our health and things like that. But, 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 8% of our worries are legitimate. I knew there would be some legitimate reason for us to worry. Well, we'll face it, half our life is intentional. Half of the things usually turn out the way we plan, and, and, and we're pretty cool about it. But then the other half seems to be constant surprises, and it's the surprises that we worry about because they can hurt us. That's that 8% that can hurt you. So we all deal with worry in different ways. Some of us make humor about it, mock it, like I do. Others will basically lead distractions, drugs, depression, anger, drinking, medication. But, but down deep, we sometimes worry about what is my life going to produce? And will this 8% destroy me? And, 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 and what am I going to do about this? Well, Jesus says, let's talk about this worry thing. And he really asks just a simple question. Why? He says, why do you worry? Look at verse 25 of chapter 6. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is not life more than food and the body more than, than clothing? Now, now, notice how he begins this paragraph. He begins it with one word. What is it? Therefore. Now, you understand in Bible study, whenever you find a therefore in the Bible, it's therefore a reason. That's why it's there for a reason. All right? And it's a conclusion. What he's talking here about worry is a conclusion of, from what he just said in verse 24. Verse 24 is the key to the whole thing of understanding what he's talking about. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you're going to hate one, love the other. Or you'll be devoted to the one, despise the other. What are you talking about? You cannot serve both God and money. So he's talking about who's going to be your master? Who are you going to trust to, to provide your meaningful life, your purpose, your, your sense of significance? Uh, you really have two choices. Money can bail you out, solve a lot of problems. So maybe if I have enough money, it will solve all my worry problems and I'll never worry again. Or... Is my master going to be God? And does God have something to say and something to do about this thing? Five times in these 10 verses, Jesus will say, stop being anxious. Stop being, stop it. I, uh, uh, my undergraduate degree is a BA in, in, in psychology. I was going to be a counselor. And I realized that that went over like a pregnant pole vaulter because my, my, my problem is that people would tell me all their problems and the only thing I could think of is, well, well stop it. I mean, you know, 
if you're doing something stupid and you're suffering, stop doing the stupid thing. But, but it didn't work very well for most people. <laughs> this word anxious, Jesus says, stop being anxious. This word anxious is interesting. It means a pulling apart, tearing you in the middle. It creates this fearfulness, this worry, this apprehension. It's ripping you in shreds. It, it, it's a sense of no peace. See, the word peace means this experience of just rest. And you can sleep at night. But when there is no peace, when there is worry, when there's a ripping inside, a, a, a collision of, 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 of concerns, it robs you of your sleep. And he says here, don't, don't let your life be ripped apart by this thing called worry. Even the word life is not the normal term bios, like survival. So I'm not talking about your survival, I'm talking about your psuche. Psuche is from where we get the word soul. Sorry about that. But he's basically saying here on soul is this idea of how we respond to a broken world around us that contains the 8% legitimate things to worry about. So he says, how are you going to respond to that? It's going to come down to a choice. What's going to master you? Are you going to look to money to bail you out of all your worries? Or are you going to look to God on this thing? So he says it has something to do with the birds. What do the birds have to do with it? Read the next verse. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not reap or sow or uh, are store away in barns, and, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you be, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Why? Why do you worry about clothing? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I, I tell you, not even Solomon in his splendor was dressed like one of these. Have you seen the beauty of flowers? How the colors always seem to go together? I always thought that if I wanted to get rich, I would start a, long, a, a, a line of clothing, all based on the color combination of flowers. I'd be, a, take it, 10% goes to the seminary, by the way. Run with it. But here he says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And he calls you a name. You little faith ones. It's not a compliment. You little faith ones. Now, what, what, what's going on here? What do the birds have to do with this? I, I wasn't sure, and so in my research, I thought I'm going to go to the park, uh, not to be homeless like Todd, but I'm just going to spend the afternoon. Although 48 hours, you ought to do it again and spend a week. No, that's the whole other thing. But I thought, I'm going to go to the park for an afternoon. I'm just going to watch the birds. And you know, as I watch the birds, I, I notice they're pretty busy. And a lot of energy collecting food. So they're pretty much involved in collecting food. But because of my insight into the human soul and the animal spirit, I, I, I could tell something was missing. And what I didn't see with all the activities, birds, is they didn't seem to be worrying very much. And they didn't seem to be worrying about how long they were going to live. He says here, worrying is not going to add one one hour to your life, the word literally is cubit, 18 inches, but the Hebraism is you can't add to your life by your worry. Psalm 139 says, when you were in your mother's womb, the days that you would live on this planet already ordained. You're going to die. You're not going to die a day before. You're not going to die a day afterwards. So why are you worrying about it? Birds don't worry about it. But on the other hand, as I was sitting there at the park, I saw something really threw my faith into a tailspin because I saw a dead bird. I went, wait, wait. I, I thought, Jesus, you said that the Father, he, he feeds all the birds. So that means all the birds are going to live forever. No, 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 you, you can't add to your life, nor is it going to add to the bird's life. And there's this dead bird. And I'm going, well, what is, what is, how does that fit into this? Should he worry a little bit? But Jesus had that covered in Matthew 10, 29, when Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? They're not very expensive. And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even when these worthless birds die eventually and fall to the ground, it's not without the father's full understanding and knowledge of it. You know what it is that... that, that Birds are not afraid of, and we are all human beings 
terrified of it? The will of God. The will of God. The point is, these birds apparently, consciously, they don't even give it much thought. And they live, they eat, God takes care of them, God's wills, and they die and they fall to the ground, but not without the Heavenly Father knowing all about it. But for us, most of us, we are fearful of the will of God. Most people are fearful of the will of God. We all know what the will of God is. It's going to break your legs and make you play the flute. You're going to have your hair in a bun, go to Africa, and never have children. We just know that God's up there and he's kind of going, oh, that's fun, that's good time, good, we'll call that evil. And that looks horrible. We'll call that godly. And there's enough Christians that do act like they've been baptized in pickle juice that they follow God and you go, man, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, I'm out of here. And so we are fearful of the will of God. And it's like God packs us bags for us. Each one of us, we have a bag. God packs our bag with unique things that makes you different from him and you different from her. God has packed all our bags uniquely and, and we've all got a nose problem. And you do know what our nose problem is, is we stick our nose in everybody else's bag. So we're like, what do you got? And quite frankly, usually we think everybody else's bag is packed better than ours. Because things happen in my life that I don't like. There's things that I don't understand why they happen. And I don't understand how God's going to bring anything good out of this whole thing. And so it makes me fearful of the will of God. Because I'm not so sure I like the way he packs my bag. And yet, remember Paul in Romans, the first uh, 10 chapters, he says, don't you know all that God has done for you? He's provided for your forgiveness. That's why his son, Jesus Christ, died in your place. He has sanctified you, set you apart for a special plan that he has for you, and that he's preserving you as one of his own children. And then, then it says in chapter 12, Paul says, now I'm begging you, here's how you respond. Chapter 12, verse 1, I'm begging you, once and for all, is the Greek grammar, present your body, your soma, your body, unto God a living sacrifice. Aren't you glad it's living? Sacrifice. Present your body a living sacrifice, for this is your reasonable act of worship. Okay, here it is. Take it. What is, what's he supposed to do with it? Here's a little key on Bible reading. Don't be afraid to read the next verse. Because verse 2 says, So stop being conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove. Ah, ah, prove something. Prove what? He says, prove that the will of God is something good, perfect, and not to be afraid of. You see, God knows he's got a PR problem. Because he's got enough people out there claiming to follow God that look like their lives are miserable and their bags have been mispacked. That God says, I'd like to have some of my children out there who could prove that somebody who's not afraid of my will would actually embrace my will and people could watch their life and see, you know, the will of God is not necessarily to break my plagues, my legs play a flute, unless I want to play the flute. Or maybe I want to go to Africa, you know, and I, I like the bun deal. I mean, it's the fact is that People are so fearful of the will of God because they see people that make the will of God so fearful. And God's looking for some folks who would just fully embrace the will of God. But what is the will of God? Again, what did we learn about Bible study? <laughs> Read the next verse. Remember the famous verse in Romans 8, 28? God works all things, all things together for good. What good? To those who love God are called according to His purpose. Now, wouldn't that verse demand an answer to a question? Like, what purpose might that be? And we learn, you find the answer where? In the next pick and verse, right? And verse 29 is when he says that the purpose of God, all things work together for good to those who love God, according to his purpose, and his purpose is to conform us into the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. God wants a relationship with us, a father to a son, a daughter. And, and the one who's got that one figured out is Jesus Christ, his own son. So when we say we're afraid of the will of God, what I'm afraid of is I'm afraid of what God's going to do to make me more like Jesus Christ. Why would I be afraid of that? Well, it may mean he may need to build some things in me that aren't there, and that's not always a lot of fun. 
It may mean he has to purge some stuff out of me that ought not to be there because it's sure not Christ-like. That doesn't always feel good either. But down deep, am I going to worry about the fact that, doggone it, I may end up like Jesus Christ <laughs> and honoring the Heavenly Father as He did on this earth. That's really what we're afraid of. Why would we worry? Well, it's just easier to, to trust that money will take care of all my worries. Well, think about it for a moment. Here's what he's saying. Fine. So you're going to let money be your master? So that will provide food for you to eat, fight, drink for you to drink, clothing for you to wear. Now, being from Scottsdale, some call it Snotsdale, I know a lot of wealthy folks. And they've got a lot of this manna, a lot of this money. And you know what they all have in common? They've got all kinds of food, and they've got all kinds of drinking, and they've got all kinds of clothing, and not one of them does not worry. They all worry. And that's the kicker. All Jesus is saying is you make money your master. You think money's going to be the thing that will solve all your worries. He's just saying you're a court low. Basically, you're a, you're a taco short of a combination plate on this one because it just doesn't happen. You will worry. And if you're going to let your money be your master and think that's going to solve your worries because money will provide everything you worry about, Jesus says, not going to happen. Never has happened. Never will happen. And when will you brighten up and realize it? So he says, you little faith ones, little faith ones, who are you going to trust your worries to? So he says, why worry? Here's how not to worry. Look at verse 31 and following. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For, for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know what worry is? It's unbelief experienced. The reason the world goes after food and clothing and money is going to bail us out because they have no other choice. It's what I call a necessary narcissism. It's because it's our model. Everybody out for themselves. Go for it. Be a taker. Define yourself on what you can get out of this world and from others. And yes, yeah, very, very interesting. Have you ever heard of a man named Viktor Frankl? Viktor Frankl. This is a man you need to know about. He was a famous, in the 40s, 1940s, he was a famous uh, neurologist psychiatrist in Austria, Vienna, Austria, uh, when the Nazis took over. When, when the Nazis went through Austria, he was arrested because he was Jewish, along with his wife, an unborn child, and his parents. He was placed in two different concentration camps, Dachau and Auschwitz. His wife died in the camp with his unborn child, his parents were executed. When, when the Allies came through Austria or Germany, he was released. But he spent the next 10 years trying to answer a question that why is it those Jews who were executed in the concentration camps had no choice? But other Jews died and were not executed in camp, and other Jews survived like he did, and he wanted to know why. Why did some survive and some die? He went on in the mid-50s to write an interesting book basically called Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. And here's what he basically came up with. The world's divided into takers and givers. If you define yourself as a taker, you define yourself, your sense of meaning, purpose, significance, based on the stuff you got from others. The stuff that you basically drew from others, you took, took, took. Then as a taker, they were the ones who did not survive. Because if you define yourself by what you can get from others, and you're in a concentration camp, there's not a lot of stuff available to take. And when they realized they could take nothing because everything was taken away from them, they had no sense of purpose, no sense of meaning, and they died. On the other hand, the givers that defined themselves, the significance, the purpose of their life, had everything to do with giving to others. Well, 
In a concentration camp, there's lots of opportunities to give. And thus they continued their sense of purpose and meaning and usefulness and they survived. Because it's exactly as the Apostle Paul said to young Timothy in Paul's last will and testimony there in 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, Paul says, Timothy, you know, in a big household, you, you've got utensils. you got gold and silver utensils used for honorable use. Then you got the earthenware stuff or the everyday stuff. He says, be used, become a vessel of honor. Purge yourself of these things like worries. And he says this, and become useful to the master. This deep, deep sense in the soul of usefulness is what gives a sense of meaning and purpose. And usefulness only comes when you're a giver, not a taker. Because if you're just taking and sucking everybody dry, what use are you? But if you're a person who gives, and that's what gives sense of the meaning of your life, is you give, a, people will remember you when you die because your life has meaning, significance, because you have usefulness. Well, what would be the greatest sense of usefulness then? Remember, Jesus says here, you want to not worry? Verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these worries will dissolve. Well, what does that mean? You've heard that before. Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. And that's one of those things we kind of all heard, but we don't have a clue what it means. His kingdom. What does that mean? In the first part of this same chapter, he, he, he gave us when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. Or if you're Lutheran, pray this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom will be done on as it is already in. What, is the, what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? To seek his will on earth as it is already in heaven. To not be afraid of his will, not be terrified by his will, but basically embrace it and pursue the will of God. That's what it means to seek his kingdom. Then what does it mean to seek his righteousness? That's one of those, again, those terms, seek his righteousness. Remember, I think I shared with you a couple years ago, and I know you all remember everything I ever shared with you. But the word righteousness is the same Greek word from where we get the word to be justified. The word is dikaios in the Greek. And basically, it's an architectural term. It's a term that architects use when they talk about a relationship between two lines in a drawing uh, to build a building. Uh, uh, if you want a right angle in the building, you have the two lines. Soon you have 90 degrees. Now you have those lines are justified made righteous, they're in a right relationship. What's he talking about pursuing God's righteousness? It's the right relationship God always wanted to have with those he created. Like, like God created creatures. We've got lots of creatures. We've got dogs, cats, bugs, worms, and you. And yet Genesis 127, Genesis says that God created us, male and female, in his own Image. He has a different plan, a different relationship with us than he did with worms and pigs and dogs and cats. And, and what is this relationship? What was supposed to be the right relationship between God and man? Why is it that when, even within the Trinity, the first person relating to the second person, the relationship was described, a relationship between a what and a what? A father and a son. Why did Jesus begin all those prayers with heavenly father? Why were we told in John 1, 12, but as many as received Jesus Christ, to them God gave the authority to become the children of God. Romans chapter 8, you were not given spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption, so we cry out, Abba, Father. 2 Corinthians 6, God says, I'll be a father to you and you'll be sons and daughters to me. That was the relationship God always wanted. That's the relationship he has with his second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And that's why he's conforming all of us to become like his son. Because the right relationship between God and those he created was to be a father and a son, a daughter to a father. And what is that relationship? A creature tries to appease the creator. Fearful, ignore the creator. Come up with a million religions to somehow keep them from killing us. But a child, a son and daughter, they have only one desire. That's to honor their father. 
when you became a Christian, owned up to your sinfulness and asked for God's forgiveness because of what Christ did on the cross for you, he didn't leave you just forgiven. He placed his spirit within you, changed his, Ezekiel 36 says, changed your heart, gave you desires you never had before. What desires? For the first time, you had this deep, deep desire to be useful to the master, to be honoring to your heavenly father. That's conversion. That was the change. And he says here, you want to take care of worry? Ha, huh. money, let that be your master. It may buy you more food, more drink, more things. Can maybe, you know, put off some of your worries. But the strangest thing, you will not stop worrying. No matter what, you will not stop worrying. On the other hand, if God is your master and you look to him, then seek his kingdom. Embrace his will. Don't be terrified of it. Don't be afraid to let God build something in you or purge something out of you or just bless you. Don't be afraid of the will of God because here's the kicker. The greater the fear of God, the greater worry. The less fear of God, the less worry because he works all things together to accomplish the purpose of his will and that relationship of righteousness of a father and a son. Have you ever seen in the mall these bratty kids being pulled by their parents? I mean, you know, you know, you know this dear father's got the two kids, you know, and they're screaming, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, you know, and they're kicking away and they're kicking each other and all that stuff. That's why I picture sometimes our heavenly father with some of us. You know, here we are, and we take the hand of our father, and he's just walking us towards, and we're going, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. You know? And, you, and it must be embarrassing to the angels. <laughs> Why don't we just relax? You're walking in the mall with your heavenly father. He's got your hand. He's got your back. Relax. Stop kicking and screaming. Stop being so terrified. He just wants you to become more like his son. Because he wants you to become more human, created in his image. Because that's where you will find your greatest usefulness and your greatest sense. And even when you get at age 63, like Pastor Dennis, although he's in denial. <laughs> although I have to say, I used to be a hunk, now I'm a chunk, he's still a hunk. <laughs> but the fact is, and it boils down to this, I, I don't. Worry just doesn't go away. Every day we will deal with it. Every day there will be something that will cause me, you, to worry. But at least I know what to ask myself now. Okay, Daryl, are you really that terrified of the will of God? Because I don't always know the how God's going to work it out. And I don't always know the why God permitted it to happen. But I do know the who. And Lamentations 3 tells me about the who. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great. Great is his faithfulness. The greater you fear the will of God, the more you're going to worry. The more you pursue the will of God and live out honoring so that you can become the will of God and become like his son, you're going to find you won't have time to worry. It will dissolve moment by moment Every time you reaffirm, oh, little faith ones, be of great faith. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for not leaving us alone in the darkness of worry. And we don't have to be split apart inside and anxious. Because, Father, sometimes we forget that the very thing we're afraid of is the very thing that we deeply desire to become. If you work all things together to conform us more to be like your son... Now, Lord, sometimes you just pour goodness and blessing upon us. Then let the world see the blessing of a man and a woman who, who indeed believe. And Father, because we believe, we trust. And because we trust, we obey. And Lord, because we obey, we experience your will, and we're not afraid of it. Lord, if you need to purge some things out of us, Cause us not to be fearful of that. And Lord, if you need to build some things within us, cause us not to be fearful of that. But may we just hold on to the Father's hand as we walk through this mall of life. Keep us from kicking and screaming. 
help us just to remember the who. The who, the Father, who will not even let one bird fall without him knowing about it. He knows us. We'll trust him in the name of Christ. And God's children said, amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Darrell. Hey, come this Wednesday night right here, 6 to 8 o'clock, for a very special night with Dr. Darrell. This Wednesday night, we're going to hand off to our venues now. Uh, if you want prayer, please come forward. We're going to have folks up front who love to pray with folks. And if you're new here or recently coming here, go on out to the Connection Center, out these doors and to your left. And we just love you. Go out and have a wonderful, wonderful day with us.